In our last unit, we talked about asexual reproduction, and then we talked about sexual reproduction and defined mating types. Now, depending on the environment and the mating type of a species, there can be strong natural selection placed on one of the sexes and very weak or no natural selection with regards to mating on the other sexes, other sex. So when there is this differential uh, natural selection, we call it sexual selection. And it all has to do with reproduction and the choice that mates make when they're deciding to reproduce. Because fitness is so intimately tied up with your ability to reproduce, there can be very, very strong selection on that decision and the choice about who individuals are going to mate with. There are two types of sexual selection that we're going to go over, and we can put all types into one of these two. The first that we'll talk about is intersexual selection, I-N-T-E-R. Now, intersexual selection occurs when there is very strong selection on one of the sexes because the opposite sex is choosing, and they're very picky about it, but they're choosing who they are going to mate with. So that's why it's called inter, because it's that dynamic between the two different sexes where that's kind of the power struggle is. This is very common among birds, and one of the most famous examples are the birds of paradise. So I'm going to play a video here. The link is in the PowerPoint. I've already got it queued up, and we'll go over it a little bit. It's a short video looking at, uh, I think it's called the superb bird of paradise, but one of the birds of paradise species. to really impress her. So the female is this kind of brown, little bit drab. She looks very similar to other birds that are closely related that don't have this strong sexual selection. And the male is here with doing the funny dance and making the funny noise. She retires consider her verdict. It's hard not to feel deflated when even your best isn't good enough. So this is just one of many uh, birds of paradise and they have very extreme uh, behaviors and bright colors, uh, funny dances in the males. If you want, when you bring this up, there are other links over here, Birds of Paradise, some other things too, but there are many species and you can look and every species is different in coloration and in behavior, but the males have to do these extreme things to convince a female to mate with them. So that's a, a example of intersexual selection. Now, amongst mammals, we more commonly see intrasexual selection, I-N-T-R-A. Now, intrasexual selection happens when there is very strong competition within just one of the sexes, and basically they fight it out within that one sex to decide who uh, will have the opportunity to mate with the other sex. And so the other sex doesn't have very much choice at all. And so we're going to look at an example here in bighorn sheep of strong intrasexual selection where the males fight and fight and fight, and whoever wins has the opportunity to mate with the females. And sometimes there's a little bit of both, so sometimes females will still have a little bit of choice. But in this one, the strongest dynamic, the uh, conflict, is between males competing for the right to mate with the females. Canadian Rockies, a battle of Olympic proportions, echoes through the mountains. The contestants are bighorn sheep, young and old rams alike, looking to make their mark. The prize is mating rights and the chance to woo the local ewes. Now notice there's still sexual dimorphism. With a number of males species. interested, there's only one way to settle the matter. The females have smaller horns and are physically a bit smaller. Headbutting. They smash into each other with 40-pound horns, so absorbing the shock with double-layered skulls. Whoever is left standing at the end is the winner. They are fierce competitors, strong, tireless, determined, and willing to use every trick in the book to achieve victory. 
This one pretends to graze to throw his opponents off guard. An old ploy, it doesn't fool the others. Two on one is a good tactic, as are shots from behind to soften a ram up. And a low blow when no one's looking. The U's watch and wait for a winner. But just because one ram comes out on top doesn't mean the females will accept him. After. So, amongst mammals, intrasexual selection is quite common. Now, when intrasexual selection is occurring, typically the males are larger and often have a kind of a offensive ornamentation like horns or some other feature. And also intrasexual selection dominates when there are polygynous mating systems, meaning um, one male can mate with multiple females. Now, nearly always this strong, strong sexual selection is on the male of the species. And in fact, uh, there's a link here. I won't, I've queued it up, but I won't bother to play it all. I'll play just a short little clip for it. But this is from a musical that uses this as kind of a piece of drama in the musical. The musical is called The Scarlet Pimpernel. It's basically kind of like uh, Batman, but in the uh, uh, 18th century where um, a rich aristocrat is going in to save people from the Great Terror during the French Revolution. So he's dressing up um, in disguise and, and goes out and saves them at night. Anyway, as part of his disguise, he dresses up and pretends that all he cares about are pretty clothes and looking good and having nice shoes. And so as part of his disguise, he tries to convince uh, the other aristocrats that they should dress up. And to do this, he uses an argument from nature. He talks about how all of these different male animals are the ones that have the bright feathers or the big horns um, I've got it queued up here. It's, a, it's, a, it's the best version I could find. There are audio versions available. This is uh, a production that was at some college um, a while back, and it looks almost like a bootleg version, but we'll play just a bit of it. that they have these beautiful uh, armaments or these bright feathers and it's always in the males and so he says that males should dress up and get pretty so anyway it's kind of a dramatic funny interpretation of that but that is a form of both inter and intrasexual selection and again in the vast majority of the time that strong selection pressure is on the males. It's less than 1% of bird species where there is some sort of a polyandrous system which tends to have a little bit more strong selection on the females, but nearly always it's on the male. So we see bright ducks where the male is bright colors and the female is kind of drab and, and camouflage. Peacocks are maybe an extreme example, those birds of paradise. So why males? Why is it so commonly the males? And it has to do with the definition of what a male is. So in the last time we talked about this definition of males and females, where males are the sex that makes the small, very numerous gametes, and females make larger, more expensive gametes. And because of that, they can only make a few. 
So the maximum reproductive output for males is much higher. So when opportunity prevents, presents itself, they can mate with many, many females and be really, really successful. And so natural selection will allow a little bit of a larger cost. This massive tail on this peacock is a huge cost in fitness in other areas, but if it allows him to mate with many females, it's going to be selected for. So because males produce the cheap and expensive gametes, so to speak, they make many, 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 and the females have the large, more energetically expensive gametes, the natural selection tends to push much more for the males, right? So just by definition, males are almost always going to be the ones that are exhibiting the strongest force of uh, sexual selection. Now we are going to define some of the concepts, four main concepts that all or some can apply to intersexual selection. So these are in instances where the female is very picky and choosy and chooses which male she's going to mate with. And every once in a while, very, very rarely, those roles are flipped and the males are the picky, choosy ones and the females have to compete for the males, but that's unusual, okay? So in these systems, one of the things that can be used is a direct benefit. Now there are many forms of direct benefit. Some of them might be a big, strong male um, who will protect the female when he is around. And that happens sometimes in some groups, but sometimes it's even a little bit more blatant than that. In this example, we have two hanging flies. These are carnivorous flies, and the arrow is pointing to a prey item that the male has captured and uses it as a bribe to get the females to mate with him. And the female will not mate or is very unlikely to mate unless he offers her a bribe, basically a, a meal uh, with it, and that allows him the opportunity to mate. And in some extreme cases, the male will even uh, sacrifice himself or there's a good chance that he will get sacrificed and be eaten. And you look at that on the surface and think, oh, that's never could be selected for by natural selection. However, in environments where it's really hard to find a mate, so your chances of another mating and being successful after that are fairly low, so your cost of dying after mating is not really much cost at all in fitness. And if sacrificing yourself gives your mate a, a boost, a head start or more energy so she can lay more eggs, then in that environment it will be selected for. And so in this, some insects like praying mantises and in some spider species, the male actually will exhibit behavior that he almost is sacrificing himself after mating or during mating for the female to eat him, gain that energy, and in that uh, species it's a, it's a benefit. So some weird things can happen. This can be very, very strong natural selection. But any immediate increase in fitness that the female gets because she chooses to mate with a male, that is a direct benefit. Now another one is called the good genes hypothesis. And this is that females will visually choose, sometimes chemically, right, maybe a smell, but she will use a signal to choose a male that is the healthiest. Now the only way this good genes system can work is if there is an honest signal. And an honest signal is one that through some mutation, an individual can't fake. So an example of an honest signal in stickleback fish, these little fish species here, is this bright red color. Now you cannot have that bright red color unless you're very healthy because it's very energetically expensive to maintain. And so unhealthy fish aren't bright colors. So this shows that he is healthier at, at, than these other three males and females prefer that. And these pop up just by random chance. You have to have the preference in the female, and then you have to have also the, uh, the phenotypic difference in the male. And if they do, and if it creates it of an advantage for one or both of those sexes, the natural selection will take over, and that will become common in the species. A third concept that sometimes goes with intersexual selection is what we call runaway sexual selection. The widow bird is an example of that, a peacock with his tail. And this is when uh, female choice is so strong and they're so picky that they push the males to an extreme, so much so that they may suffer some fitness disadvantages in other areas. Like this bird may have trouble flying or avoiding predators because of his incredibly long tail. And the only reason he has it is because females prefer it. Now, this might also be good genes because you may not be able to maintain a really large healthy tail unless you ha are healthy healthy yourself and have really good genes. But there are some cases where the female prefers something that is not really a indicator of health in other ways. 
So runaway selection may not indicate a good healthy male. It might just be, well, that's the random mutation the females preferred, and so the males are being selected to have it. So to test this, we would need to do some experiments. We would need to manipulate and look at the health of offspring of males with short tails versus long tails and see if the long tail really does correspond with a better genetic background. And if it does, then this runaway select sexual selection may also be in a good genes system. But if not, which has happened sometimes, then it may just be, well, that's just what the females like. The fourth and final thing that we're going to talk about is called sensory bias. Now, sensory bias is a fairly simple concept. This is the idea that most often it is the female's choice that evolves first. The female likes something. And then maybe even many, many thousands of generations later, a random male will have a new mutation. And so he has that thing that the, the, the females are already neurologically programmed to really, really like. Okay? And the way that we test this is to look at onophylogeny. It's a rather simple prediction. And this is that if the female choice does uh, evolve first, so they're already biased towards some sort of behavior, that we will be able to map that early on and that closely related species that do not show the male behavior, like this one right here. So the females prefer a chuck. Sorry, it's this one. The females really prefer this call that the males make. But the males of this species never make it like they do in this other species where it's been really driven for. So the female preference evolved, but it's only in a single species um, where the males have also evolved that tendency. And we can see this in swordfish also, and they've done experiments where in closely related species to these swordfish, where the males have these really elongate tails, that if they artificially enhance a male, right? So in, in some of the closely related species, the males never grow those tails. But if they artificially enhance a male and give him basically a fake extension on the end of his tail, the females just go crazy and they really, really prefer that. But that random mutation has not popped up yet in that one species. It has in others where the female preference and the male uh, phenotype have evolved and so are selected for. Next time we'll look at some intrasexual selection and wrap up our section on sexual selection.